Today we're going to talk about neck reinforcement. All right, neck reinforcements, what do they do? Why do we need them? Do we need them is the question. And there's a lot of varying opinions upon this. I'm gonna to try to approach this from a more analytical standpoint. Now, first off, the basic premise of neck reinforcement is to make it stronger than the neck would itself. So stronger, stiffer, more resilient to changes due to humidity changes and things like that is the primary purpose. Now that does not negate the responsibility of the builder to make sure they're using appropriate wood for the neck and that it has been properly dried uh, so that it can avoid as much changing as possible. Some of these modern day torrified woods actually are pretty cool and that's a whole different subject because they molecularly change um, the structure of the wood and make it a lot more resilient to changes in humidity. So obviously when you're talking about wood, a soft wood, i.e. poplar, which is not a real neck, it's a demonstration neck for school, uh, is not going to be good as a hardwood, i.e. maple. And a flat sawn piece of hardwood is not going to be as stable, resilient to flexing, as a quarter sawn piece of wood. Now hopefully you understand those premises. Now. When you go out and you look for information about neck reinforcement, there's several different kinds out there and they're used for different purposes or for different preferences. But you don't really get much of an analytical look at neck reinforcement and why you'd use one over the other and things like that. So it comes down to personal preference uh, based upon this is what I saw so and so do. And and in fact, what you'll find is you'll find videos, you know, where guys say, yeah, I used neck reinforcement, carbon fiber, because it's super strong and I can't even bend it. Ugh. What does that mean? You can't even bend it. You know, some flex is going to be required for relief in the neck. So you do want to stiffen up the neck, but, but holding your thumbs right next to each other and saying that you can't bend it doesn't do anything. It's hard to bend this close, but you move out to here, you can get a little bit of flex out of it. So what is the true story about these things? And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Let's bring it back to types of neck reinforcement. Okay, this is a piece of maple cut quarter inch by quarter inch. And one way it's mostly quarter sawn and the other way it's not. Um, this is actually used for neck reinforcement in a lot of classical guitars, nylon string guitars, because it adds a sense of rigidity to like a Spanish cedar uh, neck. It would be more rigid than that, but you can see there's a whole lot of flex in this. No matter which way I do it, quarter sawn or flat sawn, there's a whole lot of flex in this piece. But for a classical guitar that's not going to have a truss rod, this helps stiffen up that softer wood that's typically used on it. So it's perfectly fine for that. But when we go to electric guitars, most of the time the electric guitar bolt-on style neck is going to be made from maple. Okay, so putting a piece of maple into a piece of maple isn't going to provide much of anything at all. So that is not one that we're really going to have as an option for us. Although for our analysis that we're doing today, I'm going to include that just as a reference point. All right, the next one I'm going to talk about is titanium. All right, and titanium is commonly referred to as the most toneful metal uh, in existence, the Brazilian rosewood of, of metal. And so therefore, a lot of folks like to use uh, titanium hardware, neck plates, control plates, you know, what have you, because they feel like it adds a special mojo to their guitar. So the, the titanium is certainly strong, okay? It can flex, it has some movement to it. The thing that bothers me a little bit about the titanium truss rods is there is a memory to it. So if I get this thing flexed enough, it'll, it'll, retain some of that flex. Now in the neck, it's not gonna be flexing a whole lot, so maybe that's not an issue. The other issue is 
Typically, titanium rods are pretty expensive, uh, $25 to $30 for your commonly produced titanium guitar neck rods. Now, you could also go directly to a metal supplier, like I've done, and get the same exact dimensions pre-cut. It's not softened on the edges, so it's not refined like the pretty ones that you'll buy for $30 a piece, but I can get these for around $8 a piece if I buy them um, from a metal supplier pre-cut. So it does make it a little bit more affordable to move that direction if titanium is your deal. Now they're typically an eighth of an inch thick and a quarter inch tall, and that provides a lot of rigidity for sure. But if you're using a router table to route the channels that are required for your neck reinforcement, I will tell you that a uh, eighth inch requires an eighth inch bit to cut that out and it's a little bit more time consuming. You gotta be a lot more careful working with an eighth inch router bit as opposed to a quarter inch router bit. Now let's talk about carbon fiber. Okay, carbon fiber, it has such a, it has such a sexy ring to that name. It, it just makes it sound like anything that has carbon fiber in it is gonna be faster. You know, and, uh, but I'll tell you what, it is, it is a very incredible material. It's been around for a long time uh, and is still not predominantly used in mass manufacturing of guitars. Uh, it is in a lot of custom shop manufacturer or smaller manufacturers um, use it, but it's still not as widespread and I don't know why because it's super amazing. Um, it has it has the rigidity that we talk about, okay? So it is very stiff, but it also bounces back every single time. It returns to its normal state. It doesn't conform to whatever bend and then kind of stay there. So that's a beautiful thing about it. Now this happens to be a solid piece of carbon fiber that is quarter inches tall and point 200 inches wide, so less than a quarter inch wide. And that's perfectly fine because we have plenty of rigidity with that width. It's the height that really gives us the strength. So that works out uh, very well. There's also out there, you'll see about eighth inch wide uh, by maybe three eighths inch tall, and that certainly would provide enough rigidity. But again, the smaller the channel that you get, the, the harder it is to route. Now this as a point 200 is a little bit more challenging. If it was exactly a quarter inch like it is this way, it would be a lot easier to route that out on your typical router table process or even a hand router for that with uh, proper guides. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. But if we went this way and we went 0 0.200 tall by 0.25 wide, it's got more flex than it did the other way. Uh, again, it's very rigid and it's better than having nothing at all. So you have to kind of analyze how am I going to install it and prep the guitar neck for it. And that may come into consideration. There's another option out there. And that option is hollow tubes, square tubes that have a round hole down through the center. These are interesting uh, because uh, first off, this particular one that I bought through dragonplate.com. And in fact, this one was also from there. Um, this is 0.25 by 0.25. It's perfectly square. It's lighter than the solid carbon fiber because of the hollow effect, but the rigidity to my hands isn't much different. It feels extremely stiff and rigid and returns back to that zero position again. So this is kind of a, a cool little offering because it, it does make it a little easier to install. Now let's talk about the price point. We talked about the titanium, but the price point of carbon fiber, if you buy pre-cut carbon fiber from a guitar supply place, we won't use any names here, but again, you may pay $15, $20, $20, uh, who knows, maybe more for these special ones that supposedly have this perfect glass-like ring to them that were specially designed for guitars, okay? You've probably seen that, all right? And, and you'll pay maybe up to $30 each. We're talking, so now carbon fiber, what, $30 to $60 per guitar because we're gonna run two parallel to the truss rod in there. And that's 
that's a lot to add to the price of a guitar every single time. The benefit is exceptional, but at what point do you get a benefit from a specially formulated carbon fiber strip and a standard carbon fiber strip? All right, that's your choice. Um, from Dragon Plate, which is not a cheap supplier either, um, but they sell these in 48 inch sticks. And if you get a 48 inch stick, depending upon the scale of your neck, you can get two or possibly three uh, pieces of carbon fiber out of that one section. And the solid tube ones will sell for about $15 a piece, plus or minus, depending upon quantity too. Uh, so $15 each, if, if I can get two out of a neck, that, that gets it down to about $7.50 uh, per rod, you know, or $15. If I get three out of there, my cost basis goes down even more. Uh, the square tube, again, on Dragon Plate, uh, sells for right around $10 a piece for a 48 stick. Again, if you only get two out of that, uh, which any guitar, you're going to get at least two out of that 48-inch stick, you're, you're down to now $5 a piece or $10 per guitar, and that is a pretty acceptable investment for the benefit that you get. So really, it's, it's up to you to what style and what price point that you want to choose. Let's give you a close-up of these rods. We've got a quarter inch by quarter inch piece of hard rock maple. Eighth inch by quarter inch, and you can see unrefined. It's pretty sharp edges, but it won't matter when it's buried. Of titanium. There's a solid piece of carbon fiber quarter inch by 0 0.200 and then there is the hollow I don't know if you can see the hollowness let me move that there we go get a little better light there's the hollowness quarter inch by quarter inch carbon fiber so let's get extra nerdy about this shall we let's break out the old scale let's see what the strength to weight ratio is on these neck reinforcements. Let's start off with our control measure. And that's the piece of quarter inch by quarter inch hard rock maple. Now, as we weigh that, we see that it is 0.4 ounces, which happens to be 11 grams. Grams might be more accurate for some of these. The titanium weighs in at 39 grams or 1.3 ounces. Pretty big difference on that one. Let's move to the solid 2.250 uh, by 0 0.200 carbon fiber. And it weighs in at 0.7 ounces or 22 grams. And the last piece would be the quarter inch by quarter inch hollow uh, square tube carbon fiber. 16 grams, 0.5 ounces. It's a little bit interesting. I knew that the, I knew that the titanium was going to be heavier than all of them because I've built with the titanium before and the necks have always felt a little heavier. So if you look at the numbers, you'll see that the titanium is more than three times heavier than the maple that was removed on a maple neck and just let a little less than three times heavier than the carbon fiber. So it does add weight. So that could be a considerable factor for you depending upon uh, what you're looking to accomplish. Now there's other videos out there that talk about the sound test specifically to carbon fiber. Um, and they'll take their, their rods and drop it on the table and they'll get a sound signature. Solid carbon fiber. Listen to the difference there. Wood, almost nothing, pretty dead, pretty absorbs all the energy. The uh, titanium, pretty sharp sound to it. 
This is getting on the verge of glass breaking right there. So if that's important to you, then that's a pretty big difference. Now l listen to the difference between the solid and the hollow. Much higher pitch. You want to hear it again? Okay, does that mean anything? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. But it is interesting to compare the tone signatures of different neck reinforcement pieces. And so again, um, titanium is known as the most toneful metal out there, but is it as toneful as carbon fiber? I don't know. I don't know. You have to decide for yourself. Now, You've been sitting there watching this video and you've been asking yourself a question. What is that green thing next to Steve on the table this entire video? What is that? What is he doing? What's going on there? This represents way too much time invested in trying to figure out the difference between these neck reinforcements. Hopefully you appreciate this because I don't have the time for this, but the curiosity got the best of me. So what is this contraption that I uh, created? Well, it's made out of Unistrut. I've got two bases. I've got two short sections. I think they're maybe like 12 or 13 inches tall. And then I got a cross member of the Unistrut. Uh, in the center, I've developed a hanging device for a scale. And down here, I've got clamps that are holding blocks with slots cut out that are going to fit the different neck reinforcement pieces. This is going to be hooked and it's going to start at a certain point which is about the height of this file here and then it'll raise until I can clear this file underneath and that gives me a differential of 10 millimeters. So here's what I'm testing. I'm testing how much force does it take to flex that neck reinforcement material 10 millimeters. Is your mind just blown right now? Is this insane? I don't know. It's, it's probably insanity more than insane. But, uh, but I, I really, what's the facts? What do we know about these neck reinforcements? And I've given you a lot of different specifications, um, both from weight and installation um, techniques and things like that, but now this is going to be the true test to me. I've already got a titanium neck reinforcement uh, rod in there, and I'm going to turn on my scale, and I want to make sure that it's got enough Enough flex where I know that I'm starting at a zero point. All right, and then I'm going to begin to apply pressure all the way up until I can fit this file underneath. And let's see how much pressure it takes to do that. The suspense is building, I know. It's pretty exciting, right? We're getting there. Coming up, there's about eight millimeters. Boom. There it is. 43.5 pounds of pressure, 43.5. Okay, so I'm taking off the titanium. I took all the pressure back off, and it, honestly, it did return to its original position. That, that totally blows me away, because I know I can bend and contort these, and they're not perfectly flat anymore, but in this particular case, 10 millimeter flex, it returned back down to that smaller uh, dimension. Okay, now for funsies. Uh, we're going to throw the maple in there. Really, that should have been our control piece. I should have started with that, but I already had the titanium in there, but whatever. So, we're starting at zero. We've got that mounted. 
let's crank up to 10 millimeters of flex and see how much pressure it takes to do that. There it is. 5.75 pounds of pressure it takes to flex that 10 millimeters. Pretty significant difference. Okay, I'm trying to keep all these variables as constant as I possibly can. I, I'm no mad scientist, maybe mad, but not, not really a scientist. So some of you that are engineers may see this as a totally uh, frivolous test, but um, I think it does give us some indicators of strength that would be collaborated with scientific, official scientific data from someone uh, more knowledgeable than me in that stuff. So now we're going to the solid carbon fiber. And again, I'm oriented so that the quarter inch is vertical, okay? Because that's the way I would install them. And I've got it at zero and I'll start cranking it up and let's see what it takes. 54.5, that is interesting, is it not? 54.5, this is the strongest, that's greater than 10 pounds of pressure more that it takes to flex that than it does to flex titanium at about half of the weight. All right, the last sample is the hollow tube, square tube of carbon fiber. Fifty four point one five. Fifty four point one five pounds of pressure. <laughs> this is impressive. So I just did some quick math here. The two strongest significantly uh, is by about twenty percent are the carbon fiber rods. 20% stronger than the titanium. And the hollow tube of carbon fiber is, is less than 1% than the solid carbon fiber rod. When you consider the maple, The carbon fiber is 10 times as strong as the maple itself. I mean, incredible, 10 times the strength. So here's the point. The point is you got all the facts based upon what I know, the best that I know. And I'm telling you, I've been going back and forth between the tubes and the rods, just not sure which one that I want to do. And after this test, I think I'm going to switch over to the rods. These are 50% less expensive, and they give up less than 1% in strength. And they're 0.25 by 0.25 inches, so they're easy to install with a standard quarter-inch router bit. Um, the titanium is cool, and that may be a marketing and sales thing to say I got titanium truss rods, but I don't see it as worth the expense for something that is 20% less strong and potentially more expensive, depending upon where you get them. What do you think of this little jig? Testing jig, more than a production jig, but nonetheless, it's a jig and spent a couple hours building this guy, sourcing the materials. Now, an episode of everything you wanted to know about neck reinforcements, but were afraid to ask, would not be complete without the installation of neck reinforcement. So when we talk about insulation, when you use titanium, um, especially if you get a good router, um, a router slot fit, you need no no glue-in process with that. Um, in fact, you just shove it into that slot raw and you put the fretboard on, little tension, little relief tension on that, on that neck and you are good. If you're using carbon fiber of any form, um, 
then you are going to want to glue that in with some epoxy. There's other things you could certainly use, but epoxy is the most common one. Um, so what I'm going to do is take this sweet neck that I'm in the middle of creating. Um, this is a perfectly quarter sawn piece of wenge uh, that I have ready to go with my truss rod slot, my carbon fiber slots. For now, until I get the fretboard glued on, I am going, I just like to pour a little bit of epoxy right into the bottom of the channel. I try to do this process as neat as possible, but you are going to get a little bit of flow, a little bit of overflow here. For whatever mess we create, I'd like to have a little bit of acetone handy. And that'll just help clean things up. And I like to use a brush to spread around that epoxy a little bit. The brushes normally come with about an inch worth of bristles to it. And I just take scissors and chop it up shorter so it's a little stiffer and I have a little bit more control um, over where everything goes. All right, more than enough epoxy in there for sure. And this brush is just squeegeeing it all along the sides. We're definitely going to get some squeeze out. When I route out these slots, I set the depth so that the carbon fiber is going to be ever so slightly recessed. I, it doesn't have to be much. I just want enough where I can rub my fingernail across it and I can feel that it's recessed. This is actually recessed about a half a millimeter. Um, and in which case, I really don't have to clamp it uh, because it is already sitting below the surface with friction fit and gravity. And as long as it's not popping up, if it's popping up, I'll take a piece of wax paper and then a, a thin shim uh, or call of some sort, and then I'll clamp this down on both rods, both sides, and that'll hold it in place until that epoxy dries. In this particular case, that epoxy is going to dry and secure cure with that rod already below the surface so it's going to fill any voids there's just no point in extra clamping pressure at this point in time so i'm content with this i'm going to leave this and just kind of let it do its thing so i've got two necks i've got the wenge neck and i've got uh, a bobinga because it's fun to say bobinga quarter sawn neck that I've already got the carbon fiber rods in and both of these will be getting uh, a pretty high quality premium ebony fretboard attached to those and I think that's going to look pretty sharp on both of these necks and these are going to be telecasters as part of the telecaster build that I am currently doing for the school that I'm teaching at the local college. So uh, these will be interesting to follow, and I'll try to update you on progress as we go. I will tell you that maybe another purpose for this jig at a later time would be to test, do the same strength test for these uh, truss rods. Now, I'm using spoke wheel style truss rods, and both of these just happen to be getting titanium uh, spoke wheel truss rods uh, put in them. Uh, but maybe I should compare these against stainless steel truss rods, against um, kind of a cheaper, you know, pop metal type um, truss rod and just see kind of the strength. But maybe I'll get curious enough to do that at some later time. But that's all I've got for you today, except that, remember, no matter what you do, start with excellence. Mm -hmm.